No? You're going to keep it for the afternoon, I understand. Yes, good, <laughs> for the discussion session. I think then we should definitely start. Okay, Johannes, thank you very much. Uh, plus uh, four, thank you. Okay, so before we start, um, I have projected here a poster from a summer student program we are offering at DESI. It's my institute here. And uh, usually there is application before end of January if you want to participate in a free summer project. This is six weeks where you get lectures and where you get to work on one of the plenty topics that DESI is uh, doing its research on, uh, specifically, you know, elementary particle physics, astroparticle physics, accelerators, theory, experiment, analysis, whatever. Yeah? So um, perhaps you finish your undergraduate degree and you have some time before you start studying at university or you would just like to get a feel on how think people are working, physicists are working in a big research lab, then you can apply for that. It's international. Is based on merit, so you better have good marks, of course, and uh, and then maybe you can come for summer 2020. So you should visit this web page here back in uh, in in about well towards the end of the year to see then the list of topics, and we are accepting every year about a hundred students. Now DEC is not the only institute that does that. Look for similar events from other institutions. So I know that there is a CERN summer student program and other major institutes have that as well. Okay, so uh, measuring astroparticles. In my last lecture, I have explained how gamma ray astronomy is done with experiments that either sample particles on the ground or on mountain altitudes, how we measure gamma rays with satellite projects, and how we measure very high energy gamma rays with Jurenkov telescopes on the ground. And towards the end of last lecture, I have shown you some results from satellite uh, experiments, and I'm continuing today now with a few more results from the ground-based uh, experiments, just to give you a flavor how things are progressing and how well uh, sources can be detected. So this is from the Hawk High Altitude Water Cherenkov Detector, uh, a sky map. You see here the galactic plane. It's kind of measuring along the galactic plane in different energy ranges. Yeah? And you see here individual projects. Remember, this was a project with lots of water tanks on 4,000 meters altitude. It was just looking up, and it saw the whole sky above it all the time. And once you do that for several years, you can work out where the, the, the sources are sitting. And you see here they have catalog numbers, 2HWC, so the second Hawk catalog with its position in the sky. But you see also that the number of sources is relatively limited. Um, this has to do with the fact that the energies have to be relatively high. With Cherenkov telescopes, we can measure down to 100 or 50 GeV. Here, the whole thing starts above 56 TeV. So we are seeing here the high energy end of, of spectra. And uh, you know, you see here that things is, are complicated. You have these colored contours, and uh, then Hawk determines what the best position for the source is. But you do have objects where there are several sources perhaps that contribute, you know, and uh, over here too. And uh, there is from other catalogs then measurements. Sometimes they do coincide, coincide relatively well, other times not. Yeah, so Hawk sees just one blob here, but Argo sees a source here, a Milagro saw a source here. So maybe this is all within the errors. 
This is sources from Veritas. There's a good agreement. Uh, here is not so good an agreement. So it's all comparing with other experiments and improving the measurement precision in order to learn in the end what the real situation is. And just to give you a flavor of the resolution, somehow, obviously, this is the size of the blob that Hawk can see. Yeah, and it can't resolve any much better than that. This is the size of the full moon. So these are really relatively poor resolution images, and uh, one would like to have that much better. Now, here is the, the sky plot now of Hawk from last year. And you see the wide areas. This is where Hawk cannot observe. Here you see a part of the galactic disk. You see a few sources that are off the galactic disk. This is uh, the crab. And in that projection, the galactic center sits right here. And then, of course, the galactic disk continues here, where obviously Hawk cannot see anything. And also coming close to that borderline here, obviously the galactic center is not detected for Hawk. So this would be a detection where showers come in at quite a big zenith angle. And they have to evolve in an atmosphere that is relatively thick. So obviously here, the sensitivity for detection degrades, whereas this part here is a part of the galactic disk where Hawk can observe right overhead. And the, um, the atmosphere is relatively thin. So you always have to fold in the sensitivity of your instrument for different energies, for different zenith angles, and so forth. So a lot here is, is missing. This shows the galactic plane as it was seen by various instruments over the time. So Milacro, this was the precursor of Hawk in New Mexico in this water pond, uh, saw the galactic disk with some, some indications of sources here. Then Hawk came along, you know, 10 years later almost, or five years later, and uh, they saw a bright band here where Milagro didn't see much. So obviously this was more sensitive, but they didn't see much over here. I don't know why that is. Pass one was only one year or so. But now with pass four, where there's four years of data, this is what you see in Hawk. Uh, and you see prominently here uh, this band of sources. Surely this is more than one source. Yeah? And to disentangle what's going on here is relatively difficult. And here, prominently, you see these two individual sources that also already Milagro has seen in taking eight years of data. So this is eight years. This is four years. You see the difference in sensitivity and quality with a more modern instrument. I've shown you that the currently active Jarenkov telescopes with four or five telescopes of about 12 meter or 17 meter diameter, and uh, they have good sensitivity at, at high energies. And uh, here is the sky obtained with these three instruments basically for the last 15 years or so. So the background map is the Fermi sky map with a galactic disk here in between. And each blob is one gamma ray source that has been discovered by Cherenkov telescopes. This is buff about 100 GeV or so. And uh, the color of the blob <coughs> indicates the type of the source. Now, first of all, you see there are several types of sources. Pulsar wind nebula. This is something like the crab. Yeah? This is the crab nebula. X-ray binaries, pulsars, uh, gamma ray binaries. Yeah? So these are binaries, binary stars that circle around each other and one more massive object sucks in material from, from uh, the other one, and in the process, gamma rays are produced. <laughs> These are the BL LUC object, uh, objects, uh, high frequency BL LUC, intermediate frequency BL LUC, 
uh, far enough Riley galaxies, flat spectrum razor, radio quasars, and so forth, all are of the type active galaxy. What does it mean, active galaxy? Uh, this means in almost every major galaxy sits a supermassive black hole. In our own galaxy, we have a black hole of two million solar masses, but there are others where the black hole has four billion solar masses. Okay, there's quite a range. Still, two million is a lot. And if this black hole feeds, kind of sucks in matter from stars, from gas clouds, and so forth, uh, the, the energy released in this gravitational inflow uh, can create these massive jets and massive emission, so to say the death cry of matter before it's falling in the black hole. And these are active galaxies that are very bright. The center of such a galaxy outshines all the stars in the galaxies. Now, in our own galaxy, which is a moderate-sized one, uh, we have about 100 billion stars. Yeah? So you have a tiny little object in the center that outshines 100 billion stars. And uh, that's why these can be seen from far. What we observe here, all these red dots, uh, are largely objects at cosmological distances. Yeah? Um, okay, so what do we have? Shell type, supernova remnants, molecular clouds that are hit by, uh, by cosmic rays, starburst galaxies. These are galaxies that, that have an unusually <coughs> high rate of star formation, and also they produce gamma ray bursts along. Then there are gray ones here, yeah, these ones. They are unidentified or dark sources. What does that mean? Well, we do see gamma ray emission from these places, but either there is no counterpart in other wavelength from that specific position, no radio, no optical, no x-ray, so we don't really know what these objects are, or here in the galactic disk, very often uh, the size of our gamma ray source is relatively big, yeah, we don't know somewhere here it is sitting, but there are many objects that potentially could produce the gamma rays. And so we cannot identify which of the objects that is seen in this, in this uh, error box is the one that makes the high energy gamma rays, and so forth. So lots of sources. We are above 200 in the moment with a threshold of about 100 GeV. They are galactic, they are extragalactic, and they are unidentified. In this case, where the gray dots sit all nicely on the galactic plane, obviously uh, they are galactic sources. Uh, but uh, on another plot, uh, with Fermi, one sees also sources sitting out here where there is no counterpart. So they do exist also in uh, clearly extragalactic origin. So gamma ray emission is present almost everywhere where there are shocks, where there are relativistic outflows of materials. And this came as a surprise. Initially, nobody knew whether at all sources will be there that make TeV gamma rays. And now, wherever we look, we see something. You know, this suggests it would be a good idea to do a full sky scan and just look everywhere. Is there something so that we can can have a, an unbiased catalog of sources. OK, so here's some highlights. I don't know uh, whether you are aware of that, but the butter and bread work of a scientist is to find results and then to publish them. And there are plenty of journals in which you could publish your results. And there are ones that are more prestigious. They are more rigorous in accepting results than others. And uh, the most prestigious ones are Nature, Science, FISREF Letters. These journals have relatively high impact factors. So if you manage to publish a result, it's widely read, and so forth, and so forth. Doesn't mean that everything is right, what is published in here. Yeah? On the contrary, some people think 
somebody has a statistical fluctuation and that could mean something exciting, you know, it's easier to get into nature and uh, unlike when you have some really solid material with a lot of statistics and so forth. Anyway, I'm just showing you this to say that there have been a lot of high rank publications on very different types of sources. Supernova remnants, microquasars, pulsars, galactic center, the, our galactic center, a galactic survey, plane survey, the large Magellanic cloud, our nearest neighbor galaxy, on black holes, on starbursts, on active galactic nuclei, on extragalactic background light. This is a remnant light from the, the formation of the galaxies and the universe, which can be measured indirectly because this light partly absorbs high energy photons. So if we have a, an active galaxy that makes a spectrum of photons going to high energies and high energy part is absorbed, you will see a characteristic cutoff. Yeah? And from measuring this cutoff for several sources, you can work out what this extragalactic background light is. There has been searches for dark matter. You know, are there some sources where we see emission that could not be explained by the normal astrophysics, by stars, by, by you know, uh, optical em uh, yeah, emission by normal astrophysical processes? If that would be the case, one could say, well, maybe in the center of that object, dark matter is annihilating and it produces an extra emission uh, in the GeV to TeV range. So searches have been negative, nevertheless, there were interesting results. Test of Lorentz invariance uh, can be made, I mentioned last time, this investigation of gamma ray bursts, cosmic ray electrons. Uh, this is kind of a cosmic ray result. With these Cherenkov telescopes, you can try and identify primary electrons. They look like electromagnetic showers, but they are diffuse. You know, you can stare at some point where it's for sure no gamma ray source, and you look for gamma-like showers from that, and so forth. And you see, I stopped here in 2016, so I should kind of add the ones that have been published uh, more recently. But of course, there are many more papers in other journals, uh, not just these three. Uh, and so this gamma ray astronomy is a, a very interesting, a very busy field. Now, uh, the HESS collaboration and the MAGIC and VERITAS collaboration have received several prizes, Descartes and Ross Prize for, for HESS, but also individuals who played prominent roles uh, were awarded uh, prizes for their work in this very interesting field. Okay, now here are a few examples. Uh, about 30 pulsar wind nebula have been detected in TeV gamma light. And uh, once you have 30 of a kind, you can start doing population studies. So of course, if you see only one source like the Crab Nebula, that's interesting, but you don't know whether that is typical for the whole population. And here now, um, we're looking at pulsars. So a pulsar is typically uh, created in a supernova explosion. A part of the st a star collapses to a neutron star that is spinning very fast. And since it still maintains the magnetic field largely of the original star, it's a very magnetized object that spins very rapidly, and that makes it easy to observe. And what you can see is this spin down power. Yeah? So uh, when the star is rotating very rapidly and it drags along a magnetic field that accelerates particles, it is slowly losing its energy by this rotation, by the emission of the particles. And you can observe that. Yeah? So here, um, you, you show, so to say, the larger the spin down power, the, the quicker it is stopped. Yeah? And after a while, it's rotating still fast, but not as fast as the beginning, and then it loses less power. And so you see here the various pulsar populations 
uh, blue, uh, black is what one can see in normal optical telescopes, and there is a correlation to the age, you see? So the young pulsars are spinning very rapidly, they lose a lot of energy by rotation, uh, the, the older ones uh, spin somewhat lower. And you see the age range is long. You know, you can basically see a pulsar that is just born and you can observe it to a billion years of age. And now we're looking, where are those that emit TeV photons? You know, the red ones, they sit clearly here amongst the younger pulsars. Well, it's maybe okay, because if you're losing a lot of energy by, by these uh, rotations, uh, then you have an energy to make TeV uh, gamma rays. The older ones uh, are producing only GeV, you know, uh, if at all. But you see there's nothing down here in the most typical optically selected pulsar area. Uh, the GeV pulsar sits somewhere here, and this is off this main main route, so it's unclear yet uh, how this comes about. Yeah? So here is a magnetosphere, the pulsar that turns around is a pulsar wind-driven, and then you get this nebula, and here is the famous crab again, seen in X-ray light, so you see something is rotating here, you see a jet coming out, and, uh, and the TeV light it at the crab comes from that nebula, it doesn't come from that central point. Now, this was a source detected by Hess uh, of a pulsar, and um, we are seeing here it is extended. Yeah? This here is the point spread function of the Hess telescope. This is so to say how a point-like source would show up in a telescope. It's not perfect, so it has a certain size, like the resolution of your, your instrument. So if we were seeing things like that, you know, we would know they are largely point-like. But we see emission that is much larger, and, um, and you see that the center of gravity of the emission is somewhere here. But what is driving this emission is this pulsar, and uh, that sits here. So you see that the emission does not come from the pulsar directly. The pulsar does something in his environment, and uh, obviously here uh, it's most prolific in producing gamma rays. So if you have now such a, a well-resolved, a big image, you know, you can now try and measure what is the energy spectrum in the different parts of this object? Yeah? So, so here uh, the, the fields are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you can measure the spectrum, the photo index in the spectrum, so how quickly the spectrum falls off, and how much photons are emitted from that specific point. And you see that here, somewhere in the perimeter of the field, we have a, a very steep spectrum, yeah? e to the minus 2.7 or so. It's relatively steep. And we have a low flux. Whereas in the center, 6, 7, 9, we have a very flat spectrum, you know, and we do have a high flux. So somehow there is a correlation. And by measuring this, if you can resolve it and you can determine for every point an independent spectrum, helps you to, to understand the mechanisms that are here at work. That was also a very interesting uh, object seen by, by Hess. It was known as RxJ1737, and uh, this image here is what you can see if you observe that with Hess. You see TeV gamma rays, and they come from this shell. Yeah? So obviously the, the object is a supernova remnant shell. The supernova set here, it exploded, and here again the, the uh, ejecta kind of plow through the interstellar field or the, yeah, the stellar material, and here is the main emission. Yeah? So for the first time, one could say, see that TeV photons were produced in the shell where the shocks are. It was not clear until then, 
that one can, can see that. And if you observe the same object in, in uh, X-ray, then you see that also the X-ray emission uh, comes from the shell and not from the central, central pulsar. So uh, for this object, I show here now the energy spectrum. And uh, I have here the scale in milli electron volt, electron volt, keV, MeV, GeV, TeV. So it's covering really the whole electromagnetic spectrum, many orders of magnitude. And the measurements shown here are done with different instrument. This is a radio instrument, gives one point here. This is X-ray. Yeah? So here we have some spectrum and Susaku, Aska and Susaku. They cover that. Then here was a measurement from Egret, the old gamma ray. It's only an upper limit, so it says the flux is below this line here. And then this is the Hess result from the slide before. Yeah? So here we are between 100 GeV and 20 TeV or so. And now you recognize this characteristic shape I have discussed previously. So we see here a nice synchrotron peak. Yeah? Obviously, there are relativistic electrons responsible for that shape. Yeah? And it nicely fits the radio and the X-ray measurements. Then we had also uh, inverse Compton effect, also with relativistic electrons that could produce higher, higher sources. Yeah? And in this case here, the inverse Compton expectation sits there. So from here, you can estimate what the magnetic field is, and then you can work out what the electron density is, and then you get some sort of prediction. And clearly, this is far below what Hess is measuring here. Yeah? So whereas if you uh, uh, assume that uh, the, cosmic the cosmic rays are produced in collisions, you know, uh, the particles produce pi zeros, and the photons come from the pi zero decay, you are able to describe that shape. So this was one of the first um, sources where one really had an indication that pion production cosmic rays are a prominent source of the, of the, the gamma rays. Interestingly, this was not an early source. So all the sources that Whipple observed, the Crab Nebula, the Makarian sources, and so forth, could be perfectly described with relativistic electrons only. Yeah? So this one was there high enough to describe the data. And so even though that we know that the universe and the galaxies are full of cosmic rays, we didn't see that at first in the, in the gamma ray spectra. But now, meanwhile, there are a few sources where one can say this is clearly a collider or a, an accelerator where a lot of uh, cosmic rays uh, are accelerated. Hess looked at the galactic center, and uh, this was one of the first sources to be observed, you know, the first instrument in the southern hemisphere with a good sensitivity. And, of course, they saw prominently the galactic center shining in TeV light. And in the same field of view, they saw also another source that was sitting there could be identified as a supernova remnant. Yeah? So nice, there is a bright gamma ray source directly in our galactic center. Then a few years later, with more data, they could subtract these. And they thought, well, what is it if we subtract these two bright ones? Do we see more emission around here? And indeed, you see that here. You know, This is the subtracted source here. This is the subtracted source of the galactic center. And there is emission, you know, blobs of extra emission that uh, are much weaker than this, but clearly visible. And interestingly enough now, you could correlate that. You can measure with radio where molecular clouds are sitting. In this case, they were looking for a line of CO, carbon monoxide. Yeah? And they had a characteristic line formation. And they found that these are exactly the position of these gas clouds. <coughs> so we get gamma rays out of it. A gas cloud is there. So the source of the gamma rays is cosmic rays going 
through these gas clouds and they produce pi zero and uh, we get a very good correlation with what we observe. So that was a very nice result. Then 2016, they took all their data together from 2004 to 2015 on the galactic center. And this is now an artist's uh, conception. So the galactic center is here. Somehow particles are accelerated further out in the dust and gas that is copious near the galactic center. The photons are emitted and they are traveling to us and can be seen. And the question was now, what energy do these particles have so that they can produce the photons we are observing? And this is shown here. So this is the photon energy. This is 10 TeV, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 TeV. Yeah, that's relatively high. And this is the spectrum that was observed. Now the individual points with error bar, you know, the error bars get big, okay, but you don't see that there is a cutoff, you know, on the time, on the energy scale up to about 80 GV. You could say maybe this is bending over a little bit, but you know, within the errors, this is consistent with a straight line here. So that means the protons that make these photons, yeah, so the particles that make these photons here must be so energetic that they are not cutting off uh, until quite a high energy. So if we observe 80 uh, TeV photons, that means the protons that have produced them must be a factor of 10 higher. So uh, say, say this is 100 TeV, a factor uh, it's 10 to the 14, a factor 10 higher is about 10 to the 15. Yeah? So this looks as if there is an accelerator that can make 10 to the 15 electron volt particles. And we call that a pevatron, yeah? an accelerator that can make PEV energies. And because there is this kink in the energy spectrum at around 10 to the 15, you remember when we have here the flux and the energy uh, doubled, double logarithmic, yeah? So log E, log flux. We had largely this, this straight line with perhaps a little bit of a kink, almost not visible in this representation. And this is at about 10 to the 15, yeah? And since that was largely the only structure that could be observed in the cosmic ray energy spectrum, there was always a suspicion that this might be the end of galactic accelerators, and the higher end was extragalactic. And so here we do see now that our, our own galactic center can accelerate particles up to 10 to the 15 at least. If we had an instrument that could measure out to say 100 TeV or so, yeah, uh, and beyond 300 TeV, 500 TeV perhaps, we could see perhaps that the galactic center at some stage can't do it anymore and we would get a cutoff like that. So this is, for instance, such a spectrum where you see a rollover, yeah, where you could say, well, here probably the accelerator ends about here and, uh, and they can't accelerate further out. So there was a very nice result, but this is difficult to get because here sits the galactic center. So one was investigating this as a background region and was taking measurements then along the distance from the, from the center. And this you see here, this projected distance, uh, the data corresponds much better to this red model than to the, the blue one. So you can say, that the cosmic rays diffuse away from the accelerator by diffuse propagation. So, you know, with steps like that, you slowly learn a little bit more about the mechanisms, a little bit more about the sources. And with every increase of sensitivity, better detectors, better telescopes, longer observing time, you, you increase what you know. So there is a pevatron at the galactic center. Uh, also, it could be shown 
that constant injection over at least thousand years uh, was needed in order to make this area around the galactic center shine in these photons as we observed it. And the current luminosity of our galactic center. So if we look how bright shines our galactic center today was not enough to, to produce the spectrum that we see over the last thousand years. So, you know, also our galactic center probably is active. And we have seen with Fermi data, the Fermi bubbles, which also indicate to some phase of activity a few thousand years back. Another very nice uh, result from gamma ray astronomy is this one. PKS2155 is a source in the southern hemisphere. It's the Parkes catalog. It was observed in, in radio telescopes long time ago and has, of course, looked at it. And down here, this dashed line was, so to say, the level of activity this thing was seen by Hess. And then in 2006, all of a sudden, it started to go wild. Yeah? So again, we are here. We have here the time axis. This is the mean Julian date. And this is in minutes. So from here to here is 20 minutes. Yeah? Now. This was so active that Hess could do individual spectral points, measure the fluxes, you know, for every minute. Yeah? So you don't have to wait half an hour before you have photons to determine a flux. You could measure that really every minute and you could see how this thing is ramping up from about 1.5 to 3 in five minutes. Yeah? Or from here to here, that's a factor of two also about five to 10 minutes. Now, what the hell could that be? I told you that these active galaxies are so bright that they can outshine 100 billion stars in their galaxy. And this guy here can switch on and off in five minutes. So if you think about that, that tells us how big the source can be, say, we have here a source, and we sit here at Earth and observe that source. And now, by magic, we are switching the source on or off instantly. Everything on. Yeah? So what happens? The first photons start to travel in this direction. At the same time, this part starts to shine. Yeah? Now, clearly, what we measure at Earth is not an instant increase from zero to one, but this one comes first, this come one, some comes last, so we will get some sort of onset, something like this. And the, the, the width of this onset here tells us how big this thing is. Yeah? So what we see here is that the width of this thing, the size of this light emission region, is of the order of five to 10 light minutes. Do you ever feel what, what is five to 10 light minutes? It's about the distance from the Earth to the sun. Yeah? The sun's light needs eight minutes to reach us. So this huge energy emission outshining 100 billion stars comes from the volume, the size of our inner solar system. What the hell can that be? Yeah. So this is a clear indication that the, the energy here is released from a very, very small object, and it can only be a black hole. Yeah. If you want to release such an energy on so short time scales, the emission region is of the order of our solar system. Now, there is a factor that still plays a role here. If this material is shot towards us with a high velocity, we get some boosting. Yeah? And we require in this at least a boost of a factor of 100. So that means the light emission region is perhaps not the Sun-Earth volume, but the Sun to Jupiter volume, you know, about 100 times larger. 
still it's coming from something that is smaller than our solar system. Unbelievable. And this is not the only one. These active galaxies tend to make things like that. Yeah? And then, oops, everything is over and it's going quiet again. And so we have to monitor many of these objects every night and see, is it active, is it active? And if yes, then we want to measure this detailed curve until it cools down again. Uh, let me explain here on this slide uh, that uh, these photons that are produced in the source cannot necessarily travel unhindered through the universe. So what we see here is the energy of a photon that is produced somewhere and wants to travel to us. Yeah? From 10 GeV, TeV, so this is a typical Cherenkov telescope area here, all the way up to 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20 electron volts. This is the highest energy we have measured with cosmic rays. And here is 10 kiloparsec, 100, 1 megaparsec, 100 megaparsecs, and so forth. So this here is about our local galaxy cluster. This is our nearest galaxy to us, about a megaparsec. This is the size of the galactic disk. Um, the diameter, and this is a distance from us to the galactic center, okay? So this green curve shows now how long uh, a photon can travel before it is absorbed. So the 100 GeV is absorbed by interaction with UV light, and it can travel out to Z equals 4 or so, or come to us from Z equals 4. So this is all really cosmological large distances. Yeah? Then the higher the energy gets, the, the more readily is absorbed. In TeV, you know, we can look out to a gigaparsec, so there are active galaxies sitting at this distance. For those far ones, we should see that the, the spectrum cuts off at some stage. This is with near infrared, far infrared energies. Now, uh, the energies are going down, as these go up, yeah, so one PEV photon can readily interact with a cosmic microwave background, and its mean free path is as short as 10 kiloparsecs. So a 10 to the 15 electron volt photon could not reach us even if the source was as close as our own galactic center. Yeah? And, uh, and then it's getting longer again, PEV, EEV, so we can see them out to our local neighboring galaxies, but not to cosmological distances. And the process is always the same, the high energy photon with some background photon sitting in the galaxy can create a pair, and then this photon is gone, and we see the corresponding absorption in the various spectra. So you could use that now, you know, you. You look at an energy spectrum of a source and uh, say if this blue is the spectrum at source, this absorption makes it kink over. So especially the higher energies are reduced a lot, the lower energies are reduced only a little, and so forth. So if reversely, now you measure an object that has a spectrum like this, you know, the, the grayish points, yeah? then uh, you, can, you can say, well, this kink off is due to absorption in the background light. So how much background light do we have to have in order to get here a relatively smooth spectrum? If you estimate too much, then you overshoot and the spectrum would look like that. This is quite unrealistic. You know, spectra are power laws with some rollover at the end when the accelerator poops out. And if you assume a realistic part, then you get maybe a spectrum like that. And this is then what you reconstruct. Yeah? So you measure that, you reconstruct for absorption, and uh, this here is due to the, the various photons uh, that are yet distributed in the universe. And with various measurements and, and also, you know, purely photonic uh, analyses, I, I can't go into the details. 
we know now that the density of photons as a function of wavelength is in this gray band here. Yeah? And it doesn't tell you much here, but I can tell you the universe is surprisingly transparent. It came as a surprise that the levels of photons are so low and the absorption is so small. On the other hand, that means we can see uh, gamma ray sources out to very large distances. So gamma rays are ubiquitous. Wherever we look, wherever something violent is happening, we see gamma rays. There are many sources, many source types. Uh, there are complex structures. For those sources that are close, we can resolve these structures. And, uh, and that's a great thing uh, with uh, imaging Cherenkov telescopes to be done. But we know as well that the instruments we have now are not at the limit of the, this technique. We can build much better. And for the last few minutes, half an hour or so, uh, I'll, I'll show you which improvements we are aiming at in the near future. The science questions are manifold. You know, we can observe supernova remnants, pulsars, AGNs, microquasars, X-ray binaries, where, where one compact object is sucking off material from a companion. Uh, gamma ray bursts, these massive explosions that release gamma rays for the duration of a few seconds or minutes and then it's all over. We can probe the origin of cosmic rays, search for dark matter, uh, look at uh, quantum gravity and Lorentz invariation things, and so forth. So there's a lot of astrophysics being done, also scope for totally new things like dark matter or Lorentz invariance violations. And so it is very worthwhile to think how you can build a much better instrument. And this much better instrument now is called Cherenkov Telescope Array. Basically, the whole community, the worldwide community doing gamma ray astronomy has come together and decided to build something much better uh, that is the global first next generation project, largely enhanced performance and energy range, two observatories, one in the south, one in the north, so you can see the full sky and uh, I want to show you how we can boost sensitivity and resolution with these Cherenkov telescopes. So um, if we have one telescope, then this is the typical size of the, the Cherenkov flight pool that arrives at Earth from a shower in the atmosphere. And this is about 300 meters across. So effectively, this is then also the area of this one telescope. If we want to improve, well, we can have several telescopes, yeah? four, for instance, like with Hess. And if then a shower falls in this darker bluish area in the center, it can be seen by all four telescopes and the reconstruction can become better and so forth. But also you see that if you add more and more telescopes, the dark blue part gets larger and larger. And the larger this is, the higher the energies you can, you, you can collect uh, photons from. Yeah? And if you then put a few detectors, a few more telescopes here in the, in the, in the middle, and you reduce the spaces, uh, you get higher and higher quality for the photons falling on there. So this is what we are trying to do. We will have a, a set of telescopes uh, to start with. Uh, these are, say, 12-meter telescopes uh, they, to arrive a, a sensitivity of a millicrab. That means a source that is only a thousandth of the strength of the crab nebula could be seen with such an array. And the sensitivity, if this is of the order of 80 meters or 100 meters distance between the telescopes, the main sensitivity is in the energy range from 100 GeV to about 10 TeV. If we add a few telescopes that are much larger, they can collect much more Cherenkov light from faint low energy primaries. So they improve our sensitivities at energies from about 10 GeV on, 10 to 100 TeV or so, 10 to 100 GeV. 
Uh, and we can do that either by having bigger dishes or alternatively, we could also have an area where the, the same size telescopes are placed just closer together. Yeah? So if you bring them closer together, you increase as well the sensitivity. And then third, to have improved sensitivity at very high energies, we build small telescopes and put them all around. We cover a big area with these small telescopes. The rationale behind that is that if you have very high energy primaries, they produce a lot of Cherenkov light, so you don't need large mirrors. You can build small mirrors, four meters diameter, say. And they see still enough Cherenkov light in order to reconstruct the showers. And then you can pull them further apart so that in the end, your effective detector becomes several square kilometers in size. And again, you can go a few decades up in energy. So this is kind of uh, computer drawn. <laughs> Big telescope, so CTA will have three sizes, uh, 24 meters diameter here, 23 meters diameter here, 12 meter diameter, and then some four to seven meters is now more down to four as an old, old image. And we spread that over several square kilometers. And if you then have many telescopes, you get these typical shower images. Yeah? And each image is from from one telescope that has a distance from the, the shower center here. Yeah? And if you have those, they all point to the point of origin. So this is an overlay. Sorry, maybe it's unclear. One telescope produces in its camera one such image. Yeah? So this is from one telescope, maybe the one that is closest here. This is from a telescope that is further out. But then, for analysis, you can put that all on top of each other, and you see where they are pointing, so the shower comes from this point in the sky. Yeah? So the, the improvements that have been done uh, are somewhat summarized here. Uh, first of all, uh, the imaging has been improved by having a larger field of view, finer pixelation, larger dishes to collect more light, do stereo observations, uh, first with two telescopes, then with larger array. Now, the photo detection have been improved. This stands for high quantum efficiency photomultipliers. Photomultipliers typically have only a probability of 25 to 30% to detect a single photon. This is, of course, bad. Huh? Nowadays, there are photomultipliers that have 60%. So this increases the number of photons you record by a factor of two, and that is equivalent to build a dish that has twice the size. Also, the photomultipliers are replaced by silicon sensors. Uh, there are novel optical concepts. You know, here we had just one dish and one camera. In the novel telescopes I'll show in a moment, there are dual mirror, two mirror telescopes that give a wider field of view with smaller cameras and so forth. Now, in parallel, we do very sim uh, detailed simulations of showers in the atmosphere, which help us with the reconstruction and the, the uh, separation of photons from hadrons and so forth. Then in every pixel, uh, it's not just one value measured, but the pixel is read out all two nanoseconds. So we get really a waveform. We see the signal grow and then reduce again. And the more details you can record, uh, the better you can reconstruct that in the end. We're using, meanwhile, deep neural networks to tell protons from, from uh, photons. And uh, we can even do run-wise simulations. Yeah, maybe I should, should go back here a little bit. If you do such an observation, a big part of this observation is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is our medium where the shower develops. But as you can see outside, the atmosphere changes constantly. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's hazy, sometimes there's low pressure, high pressure, there's aerosols. You know, if the wind is bad, then the exhaust 
gases from all the big cities drift over your array and so forth. So the, mon the, the atmosphere has to be monitored constantly yeah, so that you know which fraction of the track of light is already absorbed in the, um, uh, by the gases and by the, the absorption, absorbance in the atmosphere. Now then, these things here, each telescope has a camera of now 2,000 pixels. Some of these pixels break. Some of the, accelerate, uh, the, the amplifiers break. Yeah? So you have never a perfect system. And you're monitoring that also constantly, and it's repaired. So one night, this channel is broken. Next night, it has been repaired, and another channel is broken. You can't easily do that in a simulation. So most simulations we have done so far is a standard atmosphere, an optimal array, and then we see what we can do. But more and more, you want to, to do run-wise simulations. So for instance, you make a simulation for a situation where the moon is coming up. You know, a thin, thin uh, part of the moon is visible. It makes stray light. The moon rises up. So if you have a second run after two hours, there is more moonlight, so that you can really reprocess an observation with a dedicated simulation that has exactly the broken channels in for that night, that has exactly the atmospheric profile we know at that night. And that was almost impossible so far, but more and more we can try that for specific observations. OK, we have seen that. Um, these are the sites. Uh, the northern side is on La Palma. It's an island off the African coast that belongs to Spain. And uh, the southern side is in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. It's an area that was given to the ESO, European Southern Observatory, where all these big telescopes are built. We want to be in a dry area in a mountain, not too high. Yeah? but absolutely try so that the atmosphere is clear, no clouds, no precipitation. That's okay here. There are clouds, but they are typically at 2,000 meters above sea level, and the observatory is 2,500 meters, so they sit above, and there's not so much disturbance. We want to be in mid-latitude, yeah? not at the equator, not at the pole. First of all, at the equator, uh, there is too much cloud. Yeah? Uh, here, if you sit at about plus or minus 30 degrees and you have a range you can good observe from plus or minus 30 degrees away from the zenith, you're covering really from the, equa the solar equator, so to say, not solar, the, uh, the star sphere equator all the way to the pole, or not quite to the pole, a little hole is left in the way also here, they can go down to, to latitudes of zero and let up to latitude 60, 70 degrees. So in combination, you cover almost all the sky. This is a picture of La Palma. It's a crater. It was a volcano. Yeah? It stopped a long time ago. And here on the rim of this crater is a big observatory for astronomy with the optical telescopes. And uh, there's an area that is reasonably flat. You see here two magic telescopes, 70 meter diameter. You see the carbon fiber structure. This is a, the mirror dish, so to say, and here is the camera. And in this area, there will be more telescopes placed now. And you can look down on the sea. This is the sea. You see the, the, the waves in the wind. And uh, usually there are clouds then down below that do not harm for the observation here. This is Chile. Uh, these are the two mountains where ESO builds the big telescopes. Cerro Paranal, very large telescopes sit here. You know, this is great, of course, if you want to build such a telescope. You go on the top of the mountain, there's rock. You, you kind of blaze away the top. You have a, a level area, and then you build your huge telescope. Same here. They're sitting on the mountain. The European extremely large telescope is being built here in the moment. And this is where CTA will be. We need a flat area 
So we're somewhat lower down, that's not so bad. The bad thing here is that this is not rock. This is sandy, this is gravel. So we have to test for every telescope what type of foundation we need. And then, of course, the Andes are earthquake country. Yeah? So we have to build our telescopes that they are not totally destroyed with an earthquake of strength eight or so, which makes it costly. But this is the plan. And this is about 25 kilometers. Yeah? So do these. you see here a street. So maybe we just build a street from here and a power line in this area. And then some, some building are made. And then here's where the telescopes will be. These are the baseline arrays. We thought, well, something like that would work. You know, Of course, uh, cryptic names, because we had many of them, and they were all tested with simulations. How do you have to arrange the telescopes that you get a best overall performance? You see here the four big telescopes in the center, 15 uh, telescopes, no, 25 telescopes of 12 meters here, and then the small telescopes around. And this is from minus one and a half. This is about three kilometers by three kilometers, so overall 10 square kilometers above. On the north, on La Palma, there's not much space. In principle, this was a bad choice. You know, We measured different locations where to build the telescopes, and there were atmospheric measurements. So everything was evaluated. In the end, the commission took all the information together, and they came out with Mexico as the best site. And then second, two sites in Arizona, and then very last, the site that Spain had offered, and that was on Tenerife, which is another island. Tenerife was too much stray light from the big city on Tenerife with a million people living. Yeah. And then the Spaniards said, oh, well, then we are out. Then no money from Spain. We must have a site on, on, a, on, a, on an island in the Canaries. And why not La Palma then? Yeah, we know we have telescopes there. So it was a purely political decision. Yeah? La Palma was, from the beginning, not even considered. And in the end, the decision was made because the Spaniards promised 40 million euros. So here we are. We, we don't have space enough to build an extension. Yeah? Maybe later on, we would have more money and we could build more telescopes around. It's impossible. Because you see here, very rapidly, there are deep cracks the area just does not allow that you go beyond this red circle. Yeah? So here we are, stuck by a political compromise. And there are four big telescopes and 15 medium-sized ones. And they said, ah, oh, well, anyway, we're looking away from the galactic center, so we won't have the high energy emission from nearby sources, so we don't need all this. So that's all there is. Yeah? It's really a foul compromise, and most people were disappointed by that. But this is now being, being built. And now here you see the sensitivity of this new thing. Sensitivity is um, the lowest flux we could measure of a source uh, in 50 hours with a sensitivity of more than 5 sigma. So if you stare at such a source, for 50 hours, you can see it. You can detect it with five sigma significance. And this is the energy where you observe that. And so with CTA South, the larger array, uh, sorry, 50 hours, yeah, this is what I said, uh, you, you could see such low fluxes. Yeah? This here, the, the red curve, is the sensitivity of Hess under the same conditions. So at TEV, CTA would be at least a factor of 10 better. Yeah? We could detect sources that are a factor of 10 weaker than what has could. Also, we can go to lower energies because we have the large telescopes and to higher energies because we have the small telescopes. So that in total, we could cover three to four orders of magnitude in energy. And uh, we have a lot of new ground where nobody has observed so far, sources at, at the highest energies. 
This is, by the way, the sensitivity of Fermi. Yeah? So 10 years of data past eight reconstruction. They are good in seeing sources at low energy, but at about 30, 40 GeV, CTA would take over and would be much more sensitive than, than anything uh, on a satellite. And you see here again, what is limiting the sensitivity uh, at low energies, the, the large size telescopes are the important ones. At uh, high energies, the small size telescopes and the large area is the important one. And here, uh, the, the best sensitivity overall is reached with the mid-sized telescopes around a TeV or so. <coughs> Angular resolution. We want to know where these photons are coming from. And if we observe with many telescopes, then each telescope gives us a, a shower image, so to say, yeah? and we can combine these measurements for an individual event, and we can reconstruct that point very, very precisely. So this is a shower where 43 telescopes have seen that same shower. And the reconstruction is very precise. You see that here, the resolution in degree is here 0.3 degree, 0.1. Yeah? So the more telescopes provide an image, the better the reconstruction is. So here we are down to 0.02 or something like that. So that means we can see the sources very sharply. And we can also recognize details of smaller sources. <coughs> also, angular resolution as a function of energy. Of course, if the shower has a high energy, many images will be uh, produced. And also there, we get then a very good resolution. And this is just to illustrate that. You know, Different sources have different distance to us. So SN1006 is relatively close, and it, it appears like that in the sky. Yeah? Uh, and you can see the emission comes from these poles here and there, and not much in the middle. So you can resolve that nicely, even if you had a resolution with your instrument of only five arc minutes. Yeah? You could see here it's bright, here it's not so bright, here it's bright again. Now, this is the nearest active galaxy to us, Sen A, somewhat smaller, M82, even smaller, Hydra, even further away. So with a resolution of only this, you can't resolve that. This will just look like a point. Also here, you will have a hard time to resolve the structures that you see in these optical images. So that's why, if you want to study morphology, you have to have a good angular resolution, and with, with many telescopes, we achieve that. Also, you're flexible in observation modes. So for instance, you could observe with all the telescopes you have the same spot in the sky. Yeah? Then you can get from showers that come from here maybe 40 images, and you see very sensitively uh, weak sources. Or you could say, well, I observe a field with half the telescopes, and at the same time, another field in the sky with the other half of the telescopes. Now, half the telescopes is less sensitive, but you can do two observations at the same time. Or you can do monitoring. Yeah? You can look at 25 AGNs every night and see whether they are flaring. And you need only two or three telescopes to, to look at one spot. Or you can observe in such a mode that each telescope looks at a slightly different field in the sky. So in summary, you cover a large area. All these are possibilities that you can do if you have many telescopes, and if you can't do, if you haven't. So again, this differential flux which we can achieve, here is the contour with CTA 100 hours or CTA 1,000 hours. I have to say, CTA can only observe when it's dark, and that is about 1,000 hours per year. Yeah? The moon is up, we can't observe. During daytime, we can't observe. Uh, bad weather, we couldn't observe. That's why it's so important we go to some place where the weather is good. Then we can achieve about 1,000 hours per year. Now, CTA is planned to operate for 30 years. Yeah? But you will not want to stare at one source 
for 10,000 hours. They would take out the instrument for anything else yeah, for 10 years. But that could be possibly achieved in a 10 or 15 years measurement campaign. If you had a very interesting object, you could perhaps get 1,000 hours. And this is the curve for Fermi detector. You see, in the combination of Fermi and CTA, we would cover here seven orders of magnitude in energy of the gamma ray sky. Very good complementarity, and we could learn a lot from that. For t uh, short time scale phenomenon, like a gamma ray burst or an outbreak of an AGN, CTA is much better. So, for instance, if CTA observes some object that flares five minutes up, five minutes down, you know, it can see that by four orders of magnitude better in the 10 to 100 GeV range, uh, sorry, second range than, than Fermi. Fermi is a great instrument. It goes around and observes the whole sky in one and a half hours. But a specific point is then only seen for a few seconds or maybe a minute. And if you want to see weak sources, you have to sum over many paths around. And then, of course, everything that just flares for a minute or two will not be seen again. So this is a great asset of CTA. CTA will be a machine for short time scale phenomena and uh, predominantly at larges, larger energy. So this is what we call transience, something that switches on and off again. OK. Uh, you know, we did many configurations and saw that the one that is good for, for low energies is then bad for higher energies and so forth. And in the end, uh, we chose this compromise I showed you before. Uh, here, E is the compromise largely we are, we are building. And uh, this is energy resolution. It's getting better and better at higher energies. This is angular resolution. We have seen that before. Uh, this here shows our galaxy. And uh, we are sitting here where this blue triangle is, our solar system. And the red dots are the sources Hess has discovered in our galaxy. Now you see they cluster around the area where we sit. So these are the sources that are close by to us. There are a few that are a little bit further away, but there's nothing from here. With CTA and the improved sensitivity, we could see all the red dots, so to say, in this area. And that means we could see everything in our galaxy. Nothing would be too far, uh, I mean, objects of that type, uh, not to be seen. So this is the visibility for uh, sources that are only 1% of the crap source. So CTA would be a great instrument. 400 times faster in surveys, very good for transients at 25 GeV, 10 to the 4 times better than Fermi. Uh, we have two observation, observatories, north and south, and so forth. And so we would expect a great uh, achievement over Hess. So Hess, in its Galactic Plane Survey, has discovered 58 sources. For CTA, in the same area, would we, we would expect to see about 600 sources. And with the extra galactic, would be well over 1,000 sources. And that is important. I show you here an interesting plot how different branches of astronomy have evolved. So for instance, detecting x-rays. In the 1960s, somebody flew a little x-ray detector on a rocket above the atmosphere. Yeah? It was really tiny, and lo and behold, this detector saw one bright source. There was an astronomical source that emitted X-rays. Wow, that was exciting. Then they built larger instruments, made better flights, and so forth. They discovered, with the next generation instrument, 15 sources, and then hundreds, and then thousands. And meanwhile, the last generation, the Chandra X-ray satellite, can identify 10,000 sources their spectra, their position, their time variability, everything. So this is a hugely productive branch of astronomy nowadays, but it started slowly. Same for gamma ray satellites. 1970, the first gamma ray, you know, energies of 
10 MeV or above has been detected. And then uh, this was something else, cos B. This here was the Compton Gamma Ray Telescope, the bus-sized thing that flew in the 1990s, came up with 200 sources. Fermi is now with 5,000 sources. And we hope that we have a similar thing for the gamma ray, a uh, ground-based gamma ray astronomy with Cherenkov telescopes. The first source detected in 1989, now a uh, very slow accumulation of about 10 sources by 2004 when Hess came active. Now we have 200 sources with Hess matching in Veritas and with CTA, we will play a role here. Once you have thousands of sources, you can do population studies. You see the variation within one class. It's a lot of things you can learn, which are totally impossible to learn if you're still here in the beginning. So this is our hope with CTA. We make the thousand sources limit. Some prototypes, of course, we build prototypes. 12 meter prototype for the mid-size telescope. We are building this, and if you come to Berlin, you can go to Adlershof and look at it, and we can even move it around for you. There are cameras. This box here is a camera with 2,000 pixels. There's one camera from Heidelberg. This is the electronics that sits in the back of it. So this box is about two and a half by two and a half meters in size, one meter deep, and weighs two and a half tons. And it's dangling here 16 meters away from the telescope and all the drink of light in these narrow facets are focused on this camera. This is now one telescope that American colleagues have designed and you see it looks different. There's one mirror here, there's a second mirror there and this is the camera. The camera here is relatively small but it has lots of pixels. And the idea is that with such a complicated optical structure, you can see a wide field of view, easily 10 or 15 degrees, and you get a very high resolution. And then you're better able to, to analyze the showers. This is called Schwarzschild Kudé. Schwarzschild lived around 1900, and he proposed such a telescope, but it was never built. This is the first real size telescope being built. It's still a prototype. Whether there will be funding to build more than that is open. This is on La Palma, groundbreaking of the first large size telescope. These are the two magic ones. You see here a few optical telescopes on the ridge. This is still a computer animation. Small size telescopes, uh, also with two mirror systems. For small size, they are really competitive, not as, as demanding as the medium size. And so we learn how to do these measurements and uh, we are waiting now for money to arrive and the political will of countries to participate in that. CTA is meant for 30 years of operation. In a desert environment, the telescopes are standing there, there is no dome, you know, the wind is blowing sand at them. They should be operational without much uh, maintenance over, over many years. The mirrors should stand that time on at least 10 years, so then recoating should be earthquake proof. Should be minimum operating costs. The five telescopes in Namibia require a team of three persons to keep them alive. Standard maintenance, you know, oiling the gears, cleaning the mirrors once a year, things like that, repairing electronics. If you have 100 telescopes, you can't have you know, 75 people doing the maintenance would be prohibitively expensive. So we need minimum operating costs. Uh, we need robust and quick construction and so forth. And these are the real challenges. Yeah? To build a telescopes like the ones we had is relatively easy, but to make them affordable over 30 years is a real problem. And what we aim is 10% of the investment cost per year in maintenance. So the price tag of the full-time CT, full-size CTA is 400 million euro. 10 years operation, another 400 million. Another 10 years, another 10 years. 
in total, this is two billion to build and operate that thing for for 30 years. And nobody gives you two billions easily. Yeah? So it's a struggle. And governments say, what's well, so expensive? And uh, can't you cut down on this? And what if you get only half your telescopes and things like that? So that keeps us going, unfortunately. The CTA consortium is big. I think we are down to 32 countries. Meanwhile, I should have made Brazil red. You know, Brazil is involved in, in that. Uh, various groups from U University of Sao Paulo, from Campinas, are involved. So ask your colleagues what they have to say and what their contribution is to the big construction. Sorry. Obviously, if you have 32 countries involved, it's not easy to get a compromise. It's not easy to tell the people from a co other country, you have to do this, spend your money for that, get it ready by the end of the year. So that is the complicated thing, you know, to get to march, to make them march together towards a common aim. So I have mentioned already particle acceleration is a big theme, probing extreme environments, physics frontiers, all that we will be able to do. And we have thought, what would we do first when CTA is built and we start measuring and we have to find key science projects, dark matter, galactic center survey, galactic plane survey, and so forth, galaxy clusters, cosmic ray pevatrons. And these are the main themes, understanding the origin of relativistic particles, probing extreme environments. And you see here where the ticks are, transients are important for many things, and so forth. And so we, we do targets, sorry, we do uh, broad surveys like galactic plane survey really, relatively early on. And we have other things where we target individual sources. So CTA will be a great instrument, has a huge science potential, and we will learn a lot. Here's a web page. Go and look for information there. Uh, there have been various documents on design concepts for CTA from 2010, a collection of science articles in astroparticle physics that can be downloaded. This is 300 pages, 120 pages. Uh, a recent contribution, well, not so recent, a contribution to the Cosmic Ray Conference in 2015. There were 17 and just 19, so a volume like that will appear soon on the archive. And this is the most recent publication. Uh, this describes these key science projects, Galactic Center and so forth. What will we be able to do above what is possible now once CTA has been finished? And this is a book. You can buy it for a lot of money, or you can get it from here. Sorry, from here, from the archive. It's just not as nicely formatted, but the articles are the same. So please have a look if you're interested. And I give you here an artist's impression. Here is where it gets wrong with the artist's impression. Okay, so 
I'll stop it here, and uh, we have time for questions. Thank you very much, Johannes. Maybe you could mention that, I don't know if it's still true, but if they get the internship in Zoyten, there is a possibility to see one of these in action. Yes, maybe? yes. The prototype for the MST uh, is uh, close to our institute, our technicians have built. And uh, from these 100 studentships of DESI, about 25 are in Zoyten, in our Berlin branch, where we do astroparticle physics. Questions for you on this? Hi, hello. I had two questions. Uh, the first one is about this uh, TEFCAT image you show, the catalog. There were a couple of uh, spots, very bright, but without any source on top of them. And I wondered what. What with any? Also. Without any? Any, any mm, point telling that there's a source there? Ah. Uh, well, the, the background image, let me see. Yeah, in the background. The background image is from Fermi. You know, this is just kind of to guide ah, okay. to guide the eye. This diffuse bluish and so forth. You mean this one, for yeah, instance? Yeah, that one. And yeah, well, this is seemingly a bright source in MEV to GEV, but it's not a source in TEV. Ah, okay. Yeah? Okay, so the now. dots... The dots cover energies above 100 GeV, and the the background image covers 100 MeV to maybe okay. 100 GeV or less. Okay, perfect. Okay, and the second one is about this uh, Schwarzschild uh, telescope. Yeah. You showed the the images in the camera. They they didn't look like the typical shower image from. From a yeah, well, telescope well, to well, do it. well spotted. So let's see what they are showing us. <laughs> I wonder if it, they are analyzed with a HILAS analysis also, or, or in a different way. Yeah, I think um, this here, this here is a simulation of a proton shower. Mm -hmm. is relatively round, that comes right down the optical axis. Then you don't see it elongated. Yeah? If, if the telescope is here and the shower goes down over there, you see it a little bit sideways. Then you get this elongated form. This one is one that comes down right the optical axis. And I think this meant to show that with the schwarzschild Coudé telescope, where you have 10 times more pixels, yeah, that the optics, the optical quality of the mirrors allows you to use 10 times more pixels. You see much more details of that. And here you can recognize something that is perhaps from an, a muon ring, or here is a muon ring. Yeah? Here you wouldn't be able to, to see that. Maybe here you can see some kind of shade. So you, this was just meant to show that there are more details that you can perceive if you have a higher resolution. So the analysis will be the same? Yeah, or... I'm sure that the the big number of pixels and the resolution will require a different analysis. Okay. You may start with a Hillas type axis determination, mm -hmm. but here you could do statistics. You know, what is the variation in pixels? How many pixels have high signals, low signals, to get a feel for the fluctuations in the shower, which you couldn't easily do here because you just don't have enough pixels. Yeah. Well, it's not a scientific question, but I'm wondering um, how the funding constrains the CTA observation modes and key scientific uh, projects? Well, that's a very good question. So, um, relatively soon after HES and started operating, it became clear that one could do much better with more telescopes. So already then, the project CTA was founded. Yeah? Three different sizes of telescopes, perhaps in total 100 telescopes. And then they guessed what the cost would be. Yeah? And 
The first number was 180 million, just for the telescopes. Yeah? And of course, then this was presented to funding agencies and uh, this number propagated. But the more you learn when you start building prototypes, when time goes by, this was, by the way, 2006. Yeah? A decade later, you, you get more expensive and you know how you have to build it. And funding agencies always said, but you said 180 million. Yeah? Then we were already at 300 million because it turned out we have to build roads. We have to have a data center. We have to have a project management. This was all not in this first estimate. So we have a really hard struggle and we are still in this process. So just the recent uh, you know, increase in cost was then from 300 million to 500 million. Yeah, because everything gets more expensive. And now the funding agencies say, what we promised, Germany promised 77 million. Yeah, that's a lot. But of course, if the project is now 30% more expensive, Germany doesn't say, our ministry doesn't say, oh, well, we get 30% more. They say, you promised you 77. If there's not enough, you have to build less telescopes. And now we are squeezed. Maybe we are not able to fund 100 telescopes. Maybe in the end it's only 50. And is it then worth it? Then maybe the gain in quality is not as big as we had hoped. So it is frustrating. But you know, if you have a better idea how to get 500 million, let us know. <laughs> yeah? And that's the same, by the way, for all the big projects. Yeah? For fusion, fusion research is going on for decades. It's getting more and more expensive and it's complicated because Every nation says, oh, but we need to be a project manager. Yeah? France is not there. Spain is not there. Wow, it's impossible. Yeah? It's just complicated. Hi. So considering that CTA is going to probe much larger energies than Fermi, for example, do you think that we should be more optimistic towards observations of the galaxy instead of extragalactic because of gamma ray attenuation? You're right. Uh, one big aim of CTA is the higher energies. And that will reduce the part of the universe we can observe it in. But on the other hand, it's the extreme end of acceleration mechanisms, of objects and so forth. And I think it will be great to learn in detail all there is to learn in galactic sources. And I'm sure we will, beside that, also learn about extragalactic stuff that is not too far away. But in the moment, there's just no way. We don't see how you can build an observatory that goes to, say, a PEV photons at large distances. These photons are just absorbed, and there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed something, but on the slide 201, <clears throat> you said the source should be a black hole. I was wondering why. Well, the argument was that we see these massive variations in output on five minutes. From that, we can conclude that the emission region for this emission is only a few light minutes. But the energy output is so massive that it's inconceivable that anything else but a supermassive black hole can be in such a small area and produce such a high energy. Is it two arguments which, you know, the black hole has different definitions. It's a black hole of the theorist, where it says, ooh, there is one over x, and x goes to zero. Yeah? So density explodes, goes to infinity. Nature doesn't know infinities, usually. You know, it kind of changes something, and then you, you avoid infinities. The experimentalists 
uh, definition of a black hole is that you have a volume in space somehow, you know, so here, there sits some mass, and say you have a star that goes around that, gravitationally bound, and from the speed of that star or of several stars, you can conclude that within this radius there must be a huge mass, four billion solar masses or something like that. Yeah? Yet you see this is a relatively small volume. So it can't be normal stellar matter. It can't be a dust cloud because you wouldn't get enough mass in here. So it must be not even neutron stars are not massive enough that you could fill this and get such a strong gravitational field. And then in the end, your conclusion is, well, that must be a black hole. It's the only thing we know where you can have, in such a small volume, such a, a large mass. And this picture is roughly like that. You know, people, are, astronomers are observing the stars in our own galactic center. And they see stars on orbits going around like that, or another one, you know, maybe going along, around like this. And if you observe many of them, yeah, they go around over 10 years or so, you see that they all speed up when they come close to the center. They get very fast and then go slow again, very fast. You have movies on the, on the internet over that. You see that for these movements, we need here four million solar masses. And there's no other way to make that than assume that there sits a black hole. That's an experimentalist's definition. Yeah? You have so much mass in such a small volume, it can't be anything we know. No stars, no planets, no gas, no neutron stars. The only thing is left is then a black hole. Are you going to be here this afternoon for the discussion yeah. session? So I suggest that we take all other questions for Johannes to the afternoon. And we thank him again. <laughs> and before going back to coffee break, you give me back the paper with the signatures, OK? Whomever has it.